We had a slight change of program today. Our um, announced or anticipated speaker um, had some problems and wasn't able to make it here today. But we're incredibly fortunate to have one of our own faculty members who um, is going to step in and uh, give us a lecture that she delivered to a national meeting as an invited talk. So I'm very anxious to hear about it. Mary Albert um, received her BS in mathematics from Penn State. She got her master's degree and her BE from the Thayer School of Engineering and then did a PhD in applied mechanics and engineering sciences at the University of California, San Diego. She's held numerous positions, um, including working at Corel. She's taught here um, as an adjunct faculty member for some time and has now joined us as a member of the faculty. She has many honors, et cetera. She has been um, the recipient of a Congressional Antarctic Service Medal. She was chair of the US National Committee for International Polar Year more than once. She has uh, received the Department of the Army Superior Civilian Service Award, which is kind of interesting, and um, again, many other things. Today, she's going to talk to us about polar science in a time of rapid change. Please welcome Dr. Mary Albert. Thank you, Ursula. And I want to thank others at the Thayer School for inviting me today and for the long lead time on this talk, but I hope, I hope, it, I hope it'll come off all right. Um, as, you, as you may be aware, uh, now is a critical time, actually, in Earth's history and in climate with a lot of different things going on. And the polar regions are indeed uh, large in the public eye. Uh, from from uh, productions in popular uh, popular uh, journals that everyone reads, Time Magazine, what's going on in the Arctic, vast images of uh, vivid images of the melting ice sheets, the melting sea ice, um, publications by the Inuit uh, people themselves on their accounts of how things are changing so dramatically up there that it's really impacting their lifestyles in a big way. Uh, uh, frequent articles in the New York Times and talks on the national public radio and talks by teachers, um, museums and outreach, outreach venues all over. Um, there are big changes happening now in the, in the polar regions. And you've seen probably many accounts of the ice sheet, the melting of the ice sheet, it's growing and melting. And um, uh, for the talk today, I'm going to talk about something that, that you probably may not have heard so much about, and that is the ice sheets. Uh, there are ice sheets in the north, in the Arctic, the Greenland ice sheet, and there's an ice sheet in the south, the Antarctic ice sheets. These ice sheets play large roles in climate. Uh, they affect sea level. As the ice sheet melts, sea level rises. As, as the ice sheet grows in cold times, sea level goes down. Sea level affects people everywhere. They archive evidence of climate. Ice sheets both in Antarctica and the Antarctic, as the snow falls, they serve as direct evidence of climates of the past. And finally, they're a chemical reactor for the atmosphere. So I'm going to give just a few examples of these things um, that, and, and in particular, home it way down to look at some things that, that have come out during the International Polar Year. Um, the International Polar Year is where uh, scientists all around the world have joined hands to do international endeavors to under, better understand climate, especially as evidenced in the polar regions. And the Pol I, uh, IPY, or the International Polar Year, was from 2007 to 2009. So it recently ended, and for this talk, I was invited um, to give it at the American Geophysical Union meeting last year, saying, well, the IPY is almost over. What has happened, even in these two short years, and we know research takes more than two years to, um, to produce journal articles and results, ask any PhD student, but um, uh, nevertheless, things had come out. So I talked about uh, the exciting things that have happened and that we've learned over the last two years. Um, from satellite measurements and measurements along the coast, we've become aware that the Greenland ice sheet is suffering huge mass loss. This is 1957 until 2007, and the IGY was the International Polar Year 50 years ago. So in the 50 years since the International Polar Year, the International Geophysical Year, you can see that the mass balance is not uniform, it changes, it has fluctuations, but since 1997 we've seen dramatic 
declines in many indicators. One thing that we've learned very recently is that melt on the surface of the ice sheet, and this is like 500 kilometers, uh, just 500 kilometers of ice beneath this, but in the summer, the sun is intense and it makes these big melt ponds or melt lakes on the surface of the ice sheet. And they noticed from satellite that these ice ponds would be there today and gone tomorrow. And a group out, uh, led by Sarah Doss, a new uh, post postdoctoral student in glaciology or postdoctoral fellow, um, designed an experiment where she was there when one of these melted. She documented the rap within hours one of these um, lakes drain, uh, drain through many many uh, meters of ice and it impacted the ice flow out at, from the edge of the ice sheet beyond that. This was not, this, this mechanism of ice sheet demise wasn't even thought of before the IPY. Similarly, we go down south to Antarctica um, and Antarctica is a, is a huge, huge continent, much, much larger than the United States, co totally covered by ice. Um, and from remote sensing images down there, they could see fluctuations in the, the, the level at different places in the ice sheet, different, different things changing dramatically, even without surface melt. There was not enough, uh, the temp summer temperatures were not warm enough to induce melt. These changes in ice sheets, so Al Helen Fricker is a young uh, uh, faculty member in California. She used the remote sensing images to say, hey, these things are, these things are changing. Lee Stearns, a, a postdoctoral uh, woman at, at uh, Maine, uh, followed up on that, followed some ice streams, watched for the, uh, the subglacial lakes to melt through satellite imagery and documented that these draining lakes, kilometers underneath the ice shelf, melt and promote fast glacial flow off, helping the demise of the ice sheet. As these, as these um, ice streams carry ice off of the ice sheet into the ocean, it helps to de um, degrade the ice sheet. Also during the international polar year, there was a focus on infrastructure. And one example of this was the formation for the Center for Remote Sensing of Ice Sheets. This center was established by the United, uh, United um, State's National Science Foundation um, in Kansas to do a, a concerted effort, a program where, uh, of intensive use of satellites to document what is going on with the Greenland ice sheet and the ice sheet um, in Antarctica. So ice sheets play a large role in climate. They, uh, they affect sea level and we can look at changes like that through, uh, through satellite imagery and through documenting sea level rise. Um, they are also archives of past climate. Um, these, these ice sheets are huge and in the center of the ice sheets and, and in Antarctica over most of the ice sheet, it is so cold there that the snow doesn't melt from year to year. The snow falls falls from the atmosphere, falls on top, and year after year the snow piles up and piles up and piles up. And you can get um, uh, this, since it's cold, it never melts. This continual accumulation of snow compresses the snow into what we call fern. And fern is simply old snow that, and in this case, has never melted. It gets compressed and there are, uh, the fern is porous, so air can diffuse through the pore spaces here. Finally, down about 100 meters deep in the ice sheet, the compression is so much that what was an air, air space within the fern crystals, uh, the only air down in the rest of the ice is enclosed in bubbles. So both the content of these snow, as they fell in, in from flakes, the isotopes indicating temperature, the, ice, uh, the snow crystals scavenging, aerosol particles, many other chem chemical indicators, both the ice that came from the snow and the air within the pore space tell really important stories about past climate. So if you're standing in a snow pit, as, we are, as this person is here in the summit, this was dug from the snow. There's a piece of plywood over, over his head, so he's in this little snow room. You can see the layers in the snow. This dark layer was formed uh, from snowfall the winter before this pi picture was taken. This, this, these lighter series of later, uh, these lighter series of snow were from the summer snow crystals 
contained under warmer conditions, less wind, falling down uh, to form this, this layer. Here's the winter before, the summer before that, the winter before that, on and on, down through the ice sheet, you go further and further into the past. Um, and the snow, in, the, the ice particles and the snow in these um, carry chemical indicators of climate. And finally, as it becomes uh, compressed into the ice bubbles, it tells about past atmospheric composition. So where we drill ice cores in polar regions, the ice is um, in central Greenland two miles thick. In many parts of Antarctica, it's as thick as three miles thick. That enables us to go hundreds of thousands of years back into the past to look at climate change. We know from these studies, for example, from the air in the bubbles, ice core evidence has shown that, that uh, and this, this was a paper published in 2008, that um, uh, CO2 changes over 800,000 years. Uh, methane changes and temperature changes are synchronous, pr practically synchronous over the times. You can see ice ages, uh, uh, warm period, interglacial, cold period, ice, ice age, but global temperature and, um, at, and CO2 concentrations have gone um, handcuffed in time for the last 800,000 years. We come here, we look at today's concentrations, they're off the graph, they're up here. And here's a, a blow up of this part of the graph. Since the Industrial Revolution, methane, carbon dioxide, as greenhouse gases have, have um, grown immediately. Uh, these kinds of rises, we know because there are measurements in Hawaii and other places on Earth where, you know, since we've had, since mankind has had science and laboratories, we can measure these things. The reason that we know what carbon dioxide was over the last 800,000 years is from those little bubbles in ice core, the only natural repository of direct atmospheric composition. From the snowflakes that fell and landed on the ice sheet, we've learned important things about human activity. Here uh, is a paper by Joe McConnell all, that came out in Science in 2007, um, and what this plots is black carbon. What he did was go to central Greenland, drill a shallow core about 300 meters deep, bring that core back to the laboratory, and analyze from the snow in that core what's the concentration um, of, of black carbon. So here from 1800 uh, up to 1900, you can see that there, there are spikes, and he measured uh, vanillic acid, which is an indicator of burning forests. So we know that there have been huge forest fires in the past that have made these spikes, and we know that over time it changes naturally. Uh, in early 1900s, you can see dramatic rises in black carbon and decrease. He was able to separate that black carbon from the carbon from forest fires through knowledge of how chemical processes work to show that this difference was due to industrial coal burning. Um, and as we limited the, uh, you know, put some regulations on coal, it became less severe. With increased use of coal, it's likely that the snow in Arctic will tell us a different story 50 years from now unless we do something. Um, as a long, this is another graph from Joe's paper showing uh, uh, how about mid-latitude coal burning. When you burn coal or you do anything in an, act in an area, those emissions can get into the upper atmosphere. They're carried to faraway spots. So this, this was coal burning, for example, in the Midwest or in Europe that made it into the atmosphere, made it up to the Arctic, was deposited with the snow in the Arctic, Years later, Joe comes along and drills an ice core to see what happened. Um, look at it, for example, at lead. And it's hard to see here, but this is 1800, 1850. This is sort of a natural background of lead that gets deposited in the snow from the atmosphere. It has natural variations. With the advent of leaded gasoline and automobiles, you see a steep rise here um, in the late 1800s. Uh, what happens here, this decline, after around 1920, what happened around 1920? The Great Depression. The Great Depression meant that there was less industry, less industry, industry was less active, people were not driving so many cars, and the snow in Greenland will tell you of, of that story of less use. It rose again when the economy got better, and what happened in the, in the uh, 1970s? Policy, the Clean Air Act. Uh, made, made use of, of leaded, unleaded gasoline in cars. Policy makes a difference. Look where we are now. 
Compare where we are now with where we were in the 1800s, a success story. This great, great um, dip, uh, people weren't happy about those accompanying um, events, uh, depression. This great event was a success because policy is effective. So the choices people make does make a difference in global atmosphere and is evidenced in nature. So Joel went to the south, too, to Antarctica. Antarctica, we think of this pristine continent. What's down south around Antarctica? Hardly anything. Can we see pollution from human in, uh, impacts in Antarctica? Well, this is 1850 to 2000, and this is Patagonia in South America. Um, and what he's looking at here is dust. So um, through, the, through the centuries, um, dust concentration in Antarctica was very low, or through the years it was very low. Uh, after 1950, it started rise. This is correlated to the overgrazing of land there, more arid land. The wind blows the dust into the atmosphere. The dust is carried to Antarctica, and our pristine continent now can tell us what was going in, at least in South America, over that time. So the ice sheets, the ice sheets are important because they can tell us what has happened in the past. Another event that we had during the International Polar Year I was involved in, in the Arctic, in central Greenland, we partnered with the French, going up again to summit in the center of the ice sheet to drill, a, to drill an ice core. And the, the object of this was to help understand how does this gas record come to be. Um, and while we were drilling the ice core, we also took samples of air from within the interstitial pore spaces of snow. If we understood how um, atmospheric mercury, if the content, if we, un if we knew what was the atmospheric composition of, of uh, gaseous mercury before the Industrial Revolution, we would have a standard by which we could set regulations to tell us what's the target now. How clean do we have to get emissions from coal-fired plants to get down to pre-industrial mercury levels? No one knows. Mercury is hard to understand because it's reactive. So what we did was measure it within the fern, and we looked at the structure of the fern, and you can see here is concentrations of mercury. It really varies according to time of year. We did them over the, over the course of the year. Varied within the top three meters of snow. Look at the scatter here that depend on time, depend on how much sun is shining. It's, it's a reactive chemistry going on there. If we look deeper, here's the, here's the atmospheric average over the course of a year in central Greenland of gaseous mercury. If we look at 10 meters and below in the fern, we get a match. So just as, as the, the top of the fern changes temperature, summer, winter, different effects change, the long-term average uh, uh, is the same as the, the current atmosphere at that time, at least within uh, 10 years or so. Is that luck? We're trying to figure it out. Did we luck out or did we find out something fundamental? So that's an ongoing process, but this the paper documenting this is in press uh, for the um, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Another event that came out, or a paper that came out during the international year was done by a student here, uh, Zoe Corville, who was my PhD student here at Thayer School. Uh, one of the great unknowns in the, in the uh, Antarctic ice sheet is the mass balance there. You can go to the Arctic and see the sea ice melting. You can see the Greenland ice sheet having melt ponds on the surface. Different story in Antarctica. The ice sheet is three miles thick. It's very cold. It's called the sleeping giant of the climate system. Is the snow accumulating there or not? One modeling paper based on very little physical evidence says there's no change in the last 50 years. Another, another paper based on um, re remote sensing imagery saying, hey, accumulation is increasing. The problem is the modeling didn't have enough data to go with it. The remote sensing images were poorly understood. Um, and so what we want to do is look at the structure of the snow to, so that the structure of the snow, which is uh, sensitive to local temperature, humidity, climate, the structure of the snow itself is a clue to the past. We went to a special area in Antarctica. This is a mega, called a megadune region, where from satellite imagery you see stripes like this. Because before people knew what it was, they called it a megadune because it looked like a really big dune. These are like several kilometers peak to peak. Um, and we had an expedition that went to Antarctica to say what's there. When you get there, it looks absolutely flat. 
These, these waves, here's a, a cartoon of one, one of these waves, is several meters high, several kilometers peak to peak. So it looks very flat when you're there. We put mat stations around. What we learned was that the weather was the same all over here. It is so flat, the temperature, the wind speed, the solar radiation is the same. Yet these signals are caused by different forms of snow. That, and we were able to show that those different forms of snow reflect the accumulation rate, the magic parameter in the mass balance for Antarctica, that the, the snow can tell us this. So this was published in the Journal of Geophysical Research. This is um, at the accumulation site. We have very small cr snow crystals at the hiatus site very large crystals because they were exposed over a long time with no snowfall at the top of them. Uh, important paper by a young investigator. Another, uh, another paper, uh, Maria Horhold was a student of mine and I was, um, she, I met Maria when I was teaching a course in snow physics in Svalbard. So Svalbard is this little island that Norway owns in the Arctic and they have a school there called Yunus where students come from all over the world to learn about sea ice, mammals, snow and things. I was teaching there and Maria, as a, a student from Germany, was a student in my class. And after the class, she said, I want you to be my master's thesis. So I, in Hanover, advised her at the Alfred Wegener Institute in Germany. The Alfred Wegener Institute had just acquired a 3D micro CT scanner. This is a, a, several years ago before we had one of these at Thayer. And so uh, Maria did the first imaging of FERN and uh, looking at the asymmetry of the, of, the, of the pore structure and how these evolved and how they're, they're stored in the FERN core down to 14 meters tells about past accumulation rates and different stories of, accum of accumulation rate. So that's, that's in press now. Uh, and Maria now finished her master's and is, is working on her PhD there. So Ecorvo, as a postdoc, is taking now these 3D micro CT images and modeling the flow of air through them uh, and the, the, the trapping of gases uh, in upcoming work through them so that we can use lattice Boltzmann modeling to say not only is that a cool picture, but we can use that three-dimensional image as the structure for a model to apply a, a pressure difference across, look at the permeability uh, from the flow due to the pressure, compare that with our measured permeability. And finally, another advancement in snow physics was from Thomas Kempfer, who's a young investigator at Corel. He was originally from Switzerland. Um, taking three micro, uh, 3D micro CT images, doing experiments with them in the laboratory, and then using phase field simulations to see if we can actually simulate metamorphism. All right, snow crystal structure is very complicated. And if we can use actual images and changes documented through time, and do modeling to understand metamorphism, the trapping of bubbles, all these different effects, uh, we can learn a lot. So as Thomas says, experiments and simulations yield insight into the processes that happen from this. Other things that happened during the, uh, the polar year that, whose publications have not come out yet but are, are big events is the Waste Divide Ice Core in West Antarctica. Um, this is a, a major effort drilling through several miles of ice to look uh, for an Antarctic record of, of high resolution record of greenhouse gas evolution over the most recent 100,000 years. And the important um, question of how stable is the West Antarctic ice sheet. If the West Antarctic ice sheet, it's, it's marine based. So it is several miles thick, yet at the bottom of that is held up by a, the tops of a few hills, most of which is underwater. When that starts to melt, because a lot of it is already floating on sea level, it could go, it could, it could um, uh, go really quickly and would raise, raise sea level as much as six meters. That's going on. Uh, the Neem Ice Core record in Greenland. This is an international effort. Uh, the Neem site is up here in northern Greenland. They, uh, this site is, this work is the result of years of planning and at the Neem site, the Neem was the end of the last warm period. The last time before the uh, uh, glacial cycle when, when the Earth's temperature was similar to today. We're drilling through the ice there to look at, to find out why and how did that last warm period end. Was there a rise in gases before it ends? What matters? How does this work? 
PhD student Caitlin Keegan here has just started her work at Thayer School on this. She spent, she spent the summer at a field camp in, in, in Nîmes uh, working with the Danes, Americans, French, an international field camp and her PhD thesis will, will contribute to the answering of some of these important questions. IPY also had new infrastructure, international partners of, in ice coring science. This is not a building, uh, this is uh, international agreements formed by scientists to say these projects are too big for us to do by one nation alone. Drilling through miles of ice, the logistics, the science, we need to join together to do these. So we formed a number of, of targets, finding the oldest ice in Antarctica, what was atmospheric mercury before the cycles that we, as we know them now. Uh, what, was, what's, what happened in the last interglacial and beyond, an analog to present day, both in Greenland and Antarctica through ice coring sciences. 40,000 near network. Let's, draw, let's drill ice cores a lot of different places to find out what are the impacts of different solar cycles, uh, different human events, Look at uh, pre-industry versus uh, the post-industrial period in the in the IPIX 2000 rays. Climate climate forcing and and uh, environmental effects during the last 2,000 years. Um, so the the international polar year has been a really very successful year in a number of endeavors. Um, another endeavor was the Antarctic Gam Gambersov project, flying over Antarctica with radar on planes, uh, gravity on planes, the highest tech equipment we have to explore a submerged mountain chain under Antarctica. They call it the last the last unknown mountain range on Earth. Um, to explore, explore it remotely through radar um, uh, flown over the ice sheet, looking into the ice sheet. During the International Polar Year, uh, there were traverses across Antarctica, whose goal was again drilling ice cores, looking at climate change. This, this, there was a traverse also 50 years ago in the IGY. So in the IPY, many, many nations joined to the gather. The U U.S. joined with Norway. Sweden joined with Japan, China, to traverse different areas of the continent, all to look at things like um, accumulation rate and how is climate changing now. Um, uh, this Norwegian, this traverse right here, I was the chief scientist on. It's the Norwegian US science uh, or traverse of East Antarctica. We use radar to look under the ice sheet. At ice coring sites, you hope that the radar shows this uniform snow layering. When we went to East Antarctica, we saw quite a different picture, okay? Even though it's fairly flat on the surface, it is, uh, it is the fern, the structure of the snow underneath, as evidenced by radar, is showing us that big changes happened in the past. What are these due to? This is a new endeavor, understanding how this happened. Our traverse, um, again, this was sponsored by the National Science Foundation in the U.S. and the Norwegian Polar Institute in Norway, going from Troll to South Pole. So this year, that, that traverse I was on, Troll, the distance from Troll to South Pole is roughly the distance from Boston to Miami. And the speed we went at using these tractors going on the ice sheet was roughly the speed of a tractor when we were moving. There was a lot of time we would stop to drill ice cores to make surface sampling. Um, accumulation rate, again, looking at the, uh, finding out how, what, how does, is um, Antarctica responding to global climate change. Results from that so far, remember earlier I said that, that uh, the modeling of East Antarctica uh, showed that there, was, that there was no change. The remote sensing imagery without any ground truth was saying, well, the snow is increasing. What, what, our, what our ice cores are showing us so far is it looks like actually the snowfall is decreasing. In other words, none of the above. So putting these together will help us better understand the satellite images, get actual data, evidence of past climate, so that we can do better representations. The IPCC report in 2007 listed East Antarctica as one of the big unknowns on of, uh, for uh, polar climate issues. And finally, the ice sheets not only affect sea level, they not only archive past climate, 
But with their vast area, Antarctica much larger than the United States, Greenland the world's largest island, they are chemical reactors for the atmosphere. Interactions that happen in the near surface snow affect with photochemical effects and, and others to, um, to affect the atmosphere, the chemistry of the atmosphere above them. Uh, bef before about eight years ago, atmospheric chemists assumed that snow is a benign lower boundary. Doesn't matter. Until they tried to model the atmosphere over the Arctic. And then they found there's big changes and we cannot reproduce those using any, any of our known mechanism. Let's go there. What we did was go there, we measured the structure of the snow, we looked at accompanying chemical reaction, and because snowflakes have such a large surface area, the exposing of that large surface area to air blown through them by wind and diffusion it was enough of an effect to change the, the um, uh, boundary layer, the composition of the boundary layer of the atmosphere. A big effort during the international polar year was new technology because we know that new technology not only fosters better research and new findings, it fosters education. The use of UAV for science, flying around with the radars on the UAV so that we can sample over a larger area. The imaging of the microstructure and the fern and what uh, the Thayer School now do to the proposal writing efforts of Ian Baker has a, a 3D micro CT imager where we can do these images now here with our students. Um, robots, robots going across the ice sheets measuring atmospheric chemistry, measuring uh, the snow properties. This particular robot was designed, by, or the effort was led by Laura Ray right here at the Thayer School. And using remote sensing images to make maps of Antarctica for the understanding of many different things and making those maps available to the public. So in the United States today, we realize how important science is. And we're here to, at the Thayer School to grow the scientists and engineers of, of, of tomorrow. If we look beyond that, who are the, who are the scientists who will, who will enter, enter our, our college 10 years from now? They're kids. We know that our future relies on science um, and that the public education of science is really rooted in what you learn in kindergarten and high school. Do you learn the scientific method? Do you know what evidence means? How do we build facts to build tomorrow's future? Um, and what we're finding today is not enough kids are really interested in science and engineering. There are not enough going into the um, college for science and engineering. So one of our efforts on, um, uh, in an international polar year, NSF funded this major effort by uh, Pol a group called Polar Palooza who had done television programs um, in the past on uh, NASA spot projects, lots of different projects. They funded Polar Palooza to go on to the expeditions, to go out on the ice sheet with the scientists to film it and bring those films back. And they made those films little clips for students to watch. And I want you to watch an example that I'm going to show and ask yourself, if you're a kid, do you want to be a scientist? If you're a kid, can you relate what you're learning in school to what they're measuring there? Can you understand it or is it all gobbledygook? And do these scientists seem like people from outer space? Can you relate to that? So there's tons of these. If you do a Google on Polar Palooza Media, there's tons of these clips that were professionally produced. Um, and I'm, I'm going to, um, this is my clue to, or cue to, to show you one from, um, that was taken on our traverse. So this, this is only about five minutes. See what you think. This is, a, I think, a huge step forward. Can you hear that? Not only exploration, but also in science, everything that, that the Norwegians have done, that the U.S. has done. Is that too loud?
We had a videographer come along with us on the uh, on the traverse who, or for the first two weeks of the traverse, who did the filming, and I did the filming of some of the rest of that. It was all just filmed as it wasn't choreographed or scripted. It took a lot of film. They used it to put it together to to uh, to make the story. These are all posted on the internet. They're all free. You can download them, show your friends. This is one episode. There's episodes from other areas of the of the traverse and from a broad array of other science. So, so what we see is that the, um, uh, the polar regions are changing rapidly due to global warming right now. And they're having global effects. 
Polar research and education are changing, um, increasingly becoming more and more, more international opportunities. Using new tools, satellite imagery, robots, imaging infrastructure, new ways of reaching to students and the public, new ways of learning. So with our rapidly changing climate, the need for sustainable technology and the crisis in public education now is a real critical time for science and education and policy to all work together towards a more sustainable future for all people. So I want to thank uh, the National Science Foundation sponsors my work in the polar regions. Um, NASA and NOAA also contributed to other talks, that, or other pieces of, of this talk. And I want to also thank the U U.S. and the international science community because if we didn't work together, we wouldn't have been able to do any of this. Thank you. window into uh, part of the world that I haven't seen. You know, you asked whether um, these scientists seems like, seem like they're from another planet, and I would say yes, but I think that the vehicles in Star Wars were a lot more sexy. So, <laughs> anyway, we do have some time for questions. I'm trying to get a global perspective on this, and from your talk, it looks like we've had permanent ice in the Antarctic region for 1.5 Yet in the Arctic region, even 100,000 years ago, Greenland was essentially green, and there was no Arctic pack ice. So um, I'm trying to correlate that with one of your slides that show that temperature, carbon dioxide, and methane have all been essentially gone lockstep with one another, and been essentially constant for 800,000 years, and yet you can't account for the the coming and going of the Arctic pack ice. Well, the thing is that the, um, the ice sheet in Greenland is uh, basically two miles thick. And that goes uh, back a little more than 100,000 years. So we know that before 100,000 years, at, at, a little bit before 100,000 years ago, there wasn't an ice sheet there and started, it started forming. Uh, but before that, there was an ice sheet there. Uh, so so that's, that's as old as, because the ice sheet that was there before that melted. Right. During the inter interglacial, so this. Uh, sorry, if I, I don't want to make you car sick, but here's the um, here's this. Okay, so this was um, this this graph 800,000 years ago was from an ice core in the center of, of Antarctica, where uh, the ice is much deeper and much older. And um, the the oldest ice we think in Antarctica is a little over a million years old, and so we want to find where is the oldest ice and try to sample it. Um, and be, before that, we don't have evidence from ice cores. But we have evidence from sediment cores in the ocean, you know, other, other um, indicators of climate change. Um, but from the ice core records, this is what ice core records contain. But I don't see the coming and going of the Arctic. You know, there was obviously significant global temperature, I would imagine, yeah. just to have Greenland be green and then it turned into a glacier and, and most of uh, North America be covered in ice. So where does that? Yeah, well, the Greenland ice sheet basically 100,000 years ago is over in this part of the plot from there till now. And prior to that? Prior to that, well, 100,000 years ago uh, in the warm period, the Greenland ice sheet melted. And so there was probably an ice sheet there before that. We have, I mean, I guess there's ge geological evidence of past ice sheets. Um, before that, but because the snow that old or the ice that old melted during this warm period, there's no more evidence that our, a Greenland ice sheet could never take us back 800,000 years ago because the current ice sheet melted bef then. The ice sheet that was there before that melted probably here and the one before that, so it's a smaller mass of ice that, is that, am I interpreting well, your question? I understand your question, I mean, what you're saying, but then so there were other significant factors at play that caused massive global temperature change. Oh, that's a really good question. What, what, what were they? Yeah, CO2 is not the only thing. What, ha what, these, what these big shifts in time, when uh, this is, where's temperature? Temperature's down here. During the warm period, uh, CO2 and greenhouse gases are high. During the cold period, they're low. These kinds of shifts on 100,000 year cycles, on very long time spans, are due to what we, know, we call Milankovitch type cycles. So the Earth in its orbit, the Earth's orbit is not always the same. It changes shape over time. And that affects um, how much sunlight 
the Earth gets um, from, from the sun. And so when the sun is, is uh, in an orbit where it's, it's, it doesn't get as much sunlight, the Earth is colder. Okay, so the orbit, orbit, orbit um, ma makes a difference. The Earth's tilt makes a difference, and the wobble around the, of the Earth, uh, the, around, uh, the Earth as it rotates around the axis, makes a difference. Those are all happening over much larger time scales than the current, the current warming. But um, uh, uh, basically, when there is uh, uh, these high um, uh, greenhouse gases occur when there is we're at a warm period. Okay, the the golden question is which is the chicken and which is the egg? Okay, um, and that we're trying to get that answer from ice cores. It's a very complicated answer. Right now, the best science scientists can tell you is that they go lockstep through time. Sometimes the CO2 is a little bit faster. Then the temperature, sometimes the temperature is a little bit faster than the CO2. Um, and these are on time scales that are on the scale of the thickness of the line. So if I plotted them all, they look synchronous on the thickness of that line. If you look at over a series of 100 years, 200 years, um, you, you can see some differences. And we're trying to sort that out. What, what is that? Yes? A sense of what? Uh, so, oh. Solar activity. Oh, okay. Solar activity. Um, uh, there are there are some scientists who think that the solar the solar flares and things affect. Uh, they do affect. I mean, we know that they're, they're important in communication and a lot of applications. Um, there's not. Uh, a lot of evidence that they have an impact on climate, but solar flares does but uh, it does affect space weather and all of our communication strategies. It's, uh, these these kind of solar events are much larger, big scale type things, longer time. How are you able to establish the age of a certain uh, layer of snow? Do you, do you count the thickness or something? Or? That's a really good question. Um, and the way they do it is, is that scientists, when they get these ice cores, that they're studied by scientists around the United States who all get together to compare their data. One way that they compare from a high accumulation site where a lot of snow falls, and like we saw the snow pit um, at Summit, um, these layers, there's winter is uh, uh, fine grain snow, summer is larger grain snow. As this becomes compressed uh, um, over, over the year, and because there is a significant amount of snowfall every year um, at Summit in central Greenland, even, as, even though it becomes compressed and event, eventually turns into ice down here, um, there you can take an ice core and see light bands and dark bands, and light bands and dark bands. So one way is of dating is physical stratigraphy. Very tedious process of counting the bands. Another way is when the snowflakes fall here, um, when there has been a, no, a volcano of a known source go off sometime in the past, that gets into the atmosphere, that gets deposited. So they, they um, uh, can uh, tell from the uh, electrical conductivity measurements when they are. Um, from the chemical measurements, they can tell um, uh, uh, different species react differently to warm, warm and cold. Um, dust, when is, the, when is the dust blowing from desert? So they basically, different universities measured these different species and then they all get together for a couple weeks and try to hack it out, it's just like, what does this agree? Is that an anomalous blip in just this message or, or whatever? But it's, it's a, um, in order to date these ice cores, it's a true teamwork effort that involves scientists from many different disciplines. Bob? Back to the previous slide. Oh, the pre the, there. Okay, so I can understand how you can get the carbon dioxide and methane from the gas, but how do you get the temperature? Okay, that's a really good question. Temperature comes because the ice core, because in the ice core, both the, the uh, ice that is deposited as crystals and the air in the pore space have clues about past climate. This air in the pore space right here becomes, at pore close off, becomes trapped in the bubble. And as that bubble 
is, is closed off from the atmosphere and more snow falls, it, go, it goes back in time. So it's, it's recorded there. So that, that, the bubbles tell us about the gas, the, um, uh, the snow chemical con concentration tell, gives us lots of clues. One of those clues is isotopes. Okay, so um, uh, isotopes are indicative of the temperature at which that water sublimated or um, condensed into snow and fell. Um, and basically, uh, to make a very long story short, this is way oversimplified, but what happens is, for example, Greenland. The air over Greenland comes from the Atlantic and air around it. As the air mass uh, goes over the ocean, it collects water, it becomes more humid. That air mass is blown up to the Arctic and it gets colder. So can cold air hold more water or less water than warm air? Less. Less. What happens to it? It falls out as snow. Okay, so it, it condenses out. Now isotopes have, um, isotopes are known as, uh, uh, of isotopes of water, hydrogen and oxygen, have different amounts of neutrons in their nucleus. When this snow falls out, or the, it falls out as rain over the ocean and then snow over the ice sheet, it turns out that the heaviest isotopes are preferentially excluded. They fall out first, the heavy ones. So, and the lighter ones fall out later. And so you can tell from um, uh, the, um, uh, per mil indicators of isotopes, they can correlate that to temperature. So the isotopes in the ice here are correlated to past temperature and there's like 10 years of study that went into figuring that out, doing experiments, doing it in Antarctica, doing it in the Arctic to come to that answer, but that's the answer. Temperature comes from isotopes and, and deuterium and things like that. Okay, I think at this point, if there are additional questions, you can come and talk to uh, Dr. Albert afterwards. Let's thank her again.